Hello and welcome back to the Plutarch Project podcast. I'm your host, Josh Niebert, and today I'm here to talk to you about something of the utmost importance. It's something you use every day, sometimes in uh, naughty ways, you filthy rascals. It's what separates us from other animals. It shapes our thoughts and our reality. And it has had the power to alter the hearts and minds of just about everyone who has ever lived. Today's topic is language. Now, I know what a few of you out there are thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know all about language. I use it all the time. What can this cat teach me about it? Well, hopefully by the end of today's podcast, you'll have an entirely new way of thinking about this integral part of your life. Before we start, though, it's important to note that this podcast is for anyone interested in the humanities. This includes experts and beginners alike. I try to keep a healthy medium in terms of the language that I use. This podcast will have some jargon. For those extra keen folks out there, I hope you don't mind me breaking down a few terms for folks that are still on their journey toward mastery. So, let's go way back in time and see where things all began. About 150,000 years ago, early Homo sapiens roamed through East Africa. About 70,000 years ago, they began successfully migrating outside of Africa. From 70,000 to 30,000 years ago, early humans began making specialized tools such as boats, lamps, weapons, and even began creating social inventions. Things like commerce, religion, and social hierarchy based upon these abstract ideas. All of this was possible due to the growth of cognitive abilities and early forms of language. Although other animals can communicate, humans have the ability to transform a limited amount of sounds to an infinite number of stratified ideas. As far as we can tell, it's only humans that can manipulate their communication style to discuss abstract ideas and things that don't even exist at all. This seems a little strange, but think about it. How often do you think your dog has talked to other dogs about, you know, Harry Potter, the latest season of Game of Thrones, or the intricacies of international politics. This ability to use our language has been one of the biggest social bonds we as a species have shared throughout time. It allows large numbers of people to believe in a common world view and to cooperate in incredibly large numbers. As Yuval Noah Harari puts it in their book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, language allows, quote, large numbers of strangers to cooperate successfully by believing in common myths." Without language, these myths and ideas would never be able to exist. Each culture, nation, family, team, basically wherever groups of humans come together, the ability to use and manipulate language, even that funky body language we use when we're traveling to other countries, binds us together in a magical way. We'll come back to the idea of common social myths in a little, but let's take a look at what language is. We're going to jump ahead a few thousand years to the late 19th and early 20th century. Ferdinand de Saussure is the man, linguistics and semiotics is the plan. For those of you unfamiliar with these terms, linguistics is the study of language and involves an analysis of language form, language meaning, and language in context. The earliest linguist was from the 6th century India. His name was Panini, and he was a grammarian studying Sanskrit. Now, semiotics is the study of meaning-making, the study of sign processes, semiosis, and meaningful communication. A subset of semiotics is semiosis. This is concerned with how utterances of sound connect themselves with concepts that we use to have meaning. Today we'll be focusing on language through the semiotic lens. There are tons of ways to look at language, but semiotics is a great place to start. We'll be primarily using Ferdinand de Saussure's work as a semiotician and linguist to think about how language is assigned meaning. If you're interested in him, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you some reference materials. You might be wondering, this podcast is supposed to be about language, not some dude from Switzerland. And you're absolutely right. Let's take off our clothes and jump right in, shall we? In the period leading up to Saussure and his developments in linguistics, uh, linguistics had already gradually begun shifting to become more scientific. During previous eras, up until the 1700s, people took a fanciful approach towards understanding language. In the late 1700s, analysts of language 
had not approached the structure and development of language in a scientific way. Of course, grammar was understood and explained well. This had been relatively unchanged going back to ancient times. Do you recall the sophists and the Roman idea of the trivium in the last episode? This line of thinking was carried on for a very large portion of human history. But, to be honest, there was very little understanding of how a language actually worked in the real world. What the rules that languages operated by, the ways in which languages are related to each other, and can be traced back to their reconstructable, unrecorded ancestral spoken languages. Things like this just hadn't been studied yet. These just weren't even options for people. People would often make up etymologies, etymologies being the origins or the start of a word, for words that were totally made up and not based on any evidence. But they did make for some good stories. You might think, but we've been using language forever! How could we not know how it works? Much like a lot of the technology we use today, we probably don't fully comprehend how it works. We can push buttons, swipe screens, maybe even conceptualize how cell networks function. But for most of us, how things work might as well be magic. Uh, just aside for a moment, a big shout out to all the folks out there who do know and keep everything running. You're all the real MVPs. This shift in how language was studied and thought about came after an English scholar and British judge living in India by the name of William Jones had a sudden realization. His realization was that the ancient language of India, Sanskrit, was closely related to ancient Greek and Latin. He proposed that they must all have some unrecorded common ancestor, a kind of proto-Indo-European language. This realization would later go on to set the foundation for historical linguistics which, by the time of Saussure, had solidified itself as a form of scientific study. Early in the 1900s, Saussure changed the course of scientific linguistics by moving away from the historical linguistics set forth by Jones, and he began analyzing how language functions. Saussure analyzed language from its most basic levels, even down to the most basic of sounds function. One notable aspect was that of sound oppositions. This is what oral language sprung from, the voice sounds of vocal cords vibrating in opposition to the unvoiced sounds in which the vocal cords are not vibrating. Uh, now, some examples of this are the T sound, the T, 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 which is unvoiced, and the D sound, D, 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 being voiced. Note, the mouth and tongue are roughly in the same position, but the vocal cords are vibrating in the D sound and not in the T sound. This study of oppositions led to the understanding that all sound variations in language that create meaning are based on oppositions and how they are articulated. This kind of analysis works all the way through grammar, an easy example being the oppositions between the present forms and the past forms of verbs. Both express different time distinctions in opposition of each other. The present only has my meaning by being in opposition to the future and the past. Saussure emphasized that language is at its core a system of signs. It is a system that incorporates the sense of hearing, seeing, speaking, and writing systems. It's important to let you guys know that writing would be considered a secondary sign system. Writing consists of visual and recorded sets of signs. These signs duplicate by representing the original sign system of language, which existed for many millennia before writing was ever thought about being used. We'll talk about writing a little bit more in the next podcast, so we're going to set this aside for the time being, okay? So now that we have all that information, a valid question to ask is, Well, what in the heck is language? Is it communication between members of a species? Is it a bunch of weird sounds and scribbles we cast out into the world? To explore this topic, we're going to start out with a bit of an experiment. I'm going to say a few words, and I want you to think about the image that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Here we go. Bushi. Popoki. Bidi. Paka. Neko. Gato. You might have guessed the word if you're a speaker of any of these previous languages. If not, the word in English is cat. Meow. This simple experiment shows one of the most vital parts of language. Quote. Language only exists within a group or community of people who adhere to certain sounds as signs for something other than sound." Unquote. 
To put it in another way, the sounds we make only make sense if they are agreed upon to mean something by members of the same linguistic group. Without this agreement, the sounds we make have no sign to correspond to. In the previous example, the fragments of sounds k, a, t, cat have been agreed upon to represent those cute little critters who meow, purr, and waste endless hours of our lives on YouTube. This is where Saucer pops into the picture. In his most, in his mostly posthumous work, Course in General Linguistics, he delves into the inner mechanisms of what makes language tick. Language is the union of image, sound, and ideas that have been commonly agreed upon by a group of society. So you might think, great, that's all language is. A bunch of folks walking around pointing at things, giving them specific sounds, and the rest of the group nodding in approval. Ah, oh, yes, yes, platypus, that's a great name, Alfonso. Great indeed. What about this thing here? Booby, ha, ha, ha. What a delightful name for a bird. But this isn't quite the way it works. It does indeed bring us closer to the truth, though. Let's think of language as a coin. On the one side, there's a concept. This is the image or idea we think of when we recognize something. On the other side is the sound image, the kinds of sounds we associate with a given concept. Saussure defines sound image as, quote, the psychological imprint of the sound, the impression that it makes upon our senses." Unquote. Now it's important to note that these ideas are very subjective when it comes down to a detailed level. In the previous experiment we talked about the word cat. Let's revisit this again. When you think of cat, immediately some image of a cat pops into your mind. But is that cat exactly the same cat that pops into my mind? Well let's find out. My cat has steely gray fur with white mustache looking patches near its long, adorable whiskers with big blue eyes. What does your cat look like? I'm willing to bet the farm that you have a slightly different version of a cat inside your head. But we both recognize some sort of image with an innate essence of what a cat is. An essence of cattiness. These essences make up what Saussure would call the signifier. Meow, they aren't perfect, but they do help work together to create a generally understood meaning. These details are what we perceive in our own mental dialogues. To recap, signs are the actual object or idea in existence. The signifier is the sound, word, or image of the sign, uh, something that goes through your senses to be understood and the signified is the mental concepts we see and understand inside of our heads. Do you recall last podcast when we talked about the Socratic method? A lot of these ancient guys were toying with the signifiers to gain a greater understanding of the signified. Without an adequate definition, language can be manipulated to mean something very different than its intention. A lot of Saussure's critics state that he didn't exactly help create the fields of semiotics and semiology, Rather, he updated the thoughts of ancient thinkers to reflect the scientific shift in language study. The connection to the sign, or the concept, and in this case the sound image, or signifier, is completely arbitrary. There is literally no reason for them to have these sounds originally. Now, with language being more understood, we can conceptualize how these languages developed from other older languages, but there is no non-arbitrary reason that they have the sounds that they do. Some guy or gal just was walking around and thought, Hey, how about I name this strange thing a cat? Which, according to etymology.com, is probably ultimately Afri, sorry, Afri, Afro-Asiatic, in which they cite the Nubian Cadiz and Berber Cadizca, both meaning cat. Now, some of you silver-tongued cunning linguists might shout, But what about onomatopoeia? Well, Saussure had an answer for this too. In short, onomatopoeia aren't directly related to the concept or the signified, but are rather imitations of sound. They do change and evolve and are different from language to language, but they are not directly related to the signified. Let's recap what we have so far. Language is a system of signs, signified, and signifiers. Language is a system of sounds that have been agreed upon by a group of speakers to represent the same sign or concept. The sounds are arbitrary. Okay, good. Uh, let's add a little more to the mix. 
This one seems obvious, but the more you think about it, the crazier it becomes. There are no ideas existing before language in regard to concept, sign, and signifier. The vast majority of our reality, as fully functioning members of a community, is perpetuated by language. Without language, we would be pure sense experience. Let that sink in for a sec. Language literally frames the way you perceive the world. Without it, how would your existence be? How would you perceive yourself? Would societies, friendship, love, hate, freedom, and life have any meaning whatsoever to you? Each language manipulates sound differently to refer to similar concepts. Also, values are created by the language system which makes them. In English, we call it a cat. In Spanish, it's un gato. And in Japanese, it's neko. The idea of what freedom is will more than likely be different in Reno, Nevada, in the United States than in Pyongyang, North Korea. Each group of people has a different idea of what this sign, signifier, and signified mean. Each uses different sounds and places a different value on simple and even more so on abstract concepts. The linguistic cultures you grow up in and exist within affect the way you use and think about language, and also the world. These differences are the evidence Saussure used to help prove that words are arbitrary. He states, quote, If words stood for pre-existing concepts, they would all have the exact equivalence in meaning from one language to the next. But this is not true, unquote. Using even a simple example of a cat has each of us filled with different mental images of cats. What about more abstract ideas such as freedom, socialism, or justice? It's here that we can connect the ideas of a 20th century linguist with what we now face in 2018. If you live within the borders of society, you are almost always deeply marinated in language. The news, the advertisements on all platforms, your friends, family, coworkers, street signs, your email, everywhere you turn you are faced with some form of language. Heck, even inside your own head your inner monologue is framed by the language or languages you know. Add in the cultural myths every culture and nation have agreed upon, and we have ourselves one heck of an abstract picture to contemplate. There's been an exhaustible amount of literature on the power of positive thinking, but quite often they reference how you talk to yourself. So take a moment and consider your relationship with yourself. What kinds of language are you using to frame your own world? Does your reality actually coincide with the language you use to frame it? Are you using language accurately with yourself and those you associate with? Next time you find yourself listening to the news, reading an article, or even chatting with a friend, think closely about the language you are being given and using. Is there a direct link to what you think they mean, or are they playing with these signifiers to alter your signified mental concept? Are they giving you the real definition of a signifier? Or are they trying to connect ideas you would presumably think as either positive or negative to the signified? All of these are huge questions that need to be asked about a government and various parts of media as well as of ourselves. When leaders talk about ideas like freedom, heritage, tradition, winning or losing, what is it that they're trying to say? And furthermore, are you certain that they aren't misusing their language to convince you of a position that actually might not even be true? I hope you take the time to think about your own relationship with language. If nothing else, you are now armed with a new way to think about how language frames the world and your place in it. Thanks for checking us out, and as always, onward. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not consider supporting us? We have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Plutarch Project. It's kind of a crowdfunding for things like this podcast an Amazon and Booking.com banner if you're planning on buying something from Amazon or treating yourself to a nice hotel stay why not give us a few cents and uh, we'll keep this thing going and we also have Google Ads on the website uh, click one give us some of that filthy dirty Google money for nothing but a moment of your time if you'd like to read the transcript or find out about other interesting topics in the humanities check out our website at www.plutarchproject.com. Now, if you notice any errors, have any questions or comments, or just want to shoot the breeze with me, you can email us at theplutarchproject at gmail.com or in the sidebar of the website. 
Thank you so much for your precious time, and have a good day. Meow.